Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to introduce Sabin Willett. Thank you very much. So, who's at Guantanamo anyway? That's what I was wondering one day last July when I walked across a sterile yard in a prison camp in Cuba toward a hut. Inside, a man was chained to the floor. Four months before, my firm had filed a habeas case for this man whose name is Adel. But I'd never seen him or spoken to him. Was he a terrorist? Was he one of the worst of the worst? You might be excused for thinking so. Before I got to Guantanamo, the vice president said, quote, the people that are there are people we picked up on the battlefield, primarily in Afghanistan. They're terrorists. They're bomb makers. They're facilitators of terror. They're members of al-Qaeda and the Taliban. But something about the way Adel looked didn't fit right from the first minute. And that day I discovered from him, and it was confirmed by the military itself, what they had kept secret from the public and even the court, which is that the military itself had concluded that Adel was innocent, not a terrorist, not an enemy soldier, never been on a battlefield. He'd been sold to U.S. forces from the soil of Pakistan, a nation with whom we have never been at war. That's who's at Guantanamo, and he's not alone. Now, on December 22nd of last year, a judge ruled in his case. He said the president was imprisoning Adel illegally. Then he went on to say there was nothing he could do about it. Adel is a Uyghur, a Turkic Muslim from the far western reaches of communist China. He's a dissident. He cannot be returned there because the Chinese would torture him or worse. The judge concluded he could not order his release within the continental U.S. because that would be to infringe on the president's immigration powers. So, for the first time in the history of our judiciary, a federal judge concluded that he was powerless to do anything about an illegal imprisonment. Last July, we moved for Adel's release. The president refused. Releasing the innocent, he said, is winding up his war-making power. How long does this power last, the judge asked. As long as it takes, the president's lawyer said. Tonight, Adel is at Guantanamo, and the president is still winding things up. Now, a professor at Seton Hall this month published a study analyzing the military's own findings. And the first and most important thing that he did was that he ignored everything that lawyers like me say. He said, all I'm going to do is take the military's findings and classify them, find out what they say. Here's what he found. Vice President Cheney says the men are al-Qaeda fighters. What do the military say? Eight percent are al-Qaeda fighters. Ninety-two percent are not. Vice President Cheney says these men were picked up on the battlefield. What does the military say? Five percent were picked up on the battlefield. Ninety-five percent were not. Eighty-six percent were sold to U.S. forces. Here is a leaflet that we distributed in Afghanistan and Pakistan. If you read Pashto, here's what it says. Get wealth and power beyond your dreams. You can receive millions of dollars helping the anti-Taliban forces catch al-Qaeda and Taliban murderers. This is enough money to take care of your family, your village, your tribe for the rest of your life. Pay for livestock and doctors and school books and housing for all your people. Vice President Cheney says they committed hostile acts against Americans or our allies. What do the military data show? 55% of the men at Guantanamo are not accused of committing any hostile act against the U.S. or anyone else. By the way, fleeing from the bombing of U.S. fighters is a hostile act. Being sold to U.S. forces is a hostile act. 
For two Saudis held at Guantanamo, their association with the Taliban is that the Taliban held them in its prisons as enemies of its regime. I'm not making this up. Who's at Guantanamo? Privates, orphans, the poor, conscripts, cooks, drivers. Abdur Syed Rahman is there. He is a Pakistani chicken farmer with the bad luck to have a name quite similar to Abdur Rahman Zahid, a Taliban official. But the chicken farmer can't get a hearing. Neither can detainee 919, an Afghan who was trying to recover stolen land deeds when the official who had stolen the land reported him as Taliban. Quote, my hands are farmer's hands marked by sickles, he says. I wasn't a big person. Neither can detainee 963. By the way, I'd tell you their names if I knew them, but they're not released. Neither can detainee 963, a farmer riding his tractor to town to get an oil filter when an American patrol came by. Neither can he get a hearing. Now I am here for two years, he said two years ago. Nobody knows why. The Taliban generals aren't there. Some are busy in the Afghan parliament that we helped to create. The former Taliban foreign spokesman, Ramatullah Hashemi, he isn't there either. Last year, the Department of Homeland Security granted him a visa, and tonight he is studying at Yale. Now, the justification for holding prisoners of war is that there is a war. But is there even a war in Afghanistan anymore? A couple of weeks ago, Secretary Rice was asked to intervene in the apostasy case you may have read about. She shrugged. It's a sovereign nation, she said. Now, the central lie of Guantanamo is the whopper, that as a general proposition, it holds terrorists. The president, vice president, their amen chorus in the Congress, they all tell you this relentlessly. These people are terrorists. Now, I don't say there's no terrorist there, but you did hear her correctly a moment ago when she said four years later only 10 people have been accused of any crime at Guantanamo. Seven of the ten are accused of conspiracy, a vague charge. Because when you search the records for what you might think of as terrorism, when you search them for bombing or planning or to conspiring to bomb or raising funds for it or even cheerleading, when you search hundreds and hundreds of military records, that's who isn't at Guantanamo. Now, the president says that my client Adel is held in the global war on terror. And since he's into his fifth year of imprisonment, let's examine this. The proposition is that so long as an undeclared global war is pending against a common noun, the president has the following powers. First, he can seize anyone anywhere in the world, transport him to Guantanamo Bay, and there hold him without any kind of hearing at his pleasure as long as the war on terror lasts. Second, he can bug your phone or your computer without a warrant as long as the war on terror lasts. Third, although on December 30th, 2005, he signed an act of Congress that forbids anyone in our government from participating in torture anywhere on the face of the earth, he can ignore that law so long as the war on terror lasts. So, Adel has a question, how long? Will the war on terror last? Well, how long has it lasted already? I think we can all agree that terrorism has flourished in the Middle East ever since Lord Balfour made his declaration in 1917. Palestinians murdered 59 Jews in Hebron in August 1929 to pick one obscenity from a 1,000. The Israeli Baruch Goldstein murdered 29 Palestinians at prayer in February 1994 to pick another from a thousand more. How far do you want to go back? Tsarist Russia, when the anarchists, we'd call them terrorists today, attacked civilians and in 1881 murdered the Tsar, to 1867 when the Fenians, precursors of the Irish Republican Army, began bombings in England? How about Paris in the 1790s when the Committee of Public Safety wreaked havoc on civilians, a time known as the Terror 
Shall we go back to the 17th century, when the murder of civilians, the destruction of homes and crops and livestock was the commonest form of warfare on this continent between the indigenous people and the invading Europeans? Pictured is my personal favorite, Lord Jeffrey Amherst, who brought smallpox-laden blankets, bioterrorism, to the Pioneer Valley. Shall we go back to the 15th century and ask the Arawaks, if we could find one, whether terrorism was practiced by Columbus? Or shall we simply go all the way back to the Zealots in the first century AD who murdered Romans and Jewish citizens viewed as collaborators? How long has terror lasted since history was recorded? Where is it today? Chechnya, Tibet, India, Indonesia, the Philippines, the Basque areas of Spain, Somalia, Rwanda, El Salvador, all over Iraq, Israel, the Palestinian territories, Oklahoma City, a farmer's field in Pennsylvania, and on Manhattan Island. We need to acknowledge, if we are thoughtful people, that terror is everywhere and has been with us always. Do we really think that during the presidency of Mr. Bush, the emperor of terror is going to come aboard a U.S. warship and sign the instrument of unconditional surrender? Can we at least be honest with ourselves? When we say that the president has special powers during the global war on terror, we are saying he has them forever. Always and forever can the president lock people up at Guantanamo. Always and forever can he ignore the Congress's ban on torture. Always and forever can he ignore the FISA court and tap your phone and download your iMac, especially here in Boston, all kinds of Odd and strange people are wandering around in Boston. I hear some of them are Muslims. Who knows what they're up to? We should detain them too, perhaps, maybe take them to Guantanamo, where the writ of habeas corpus has been abolished. Now, for seven centuries, habeas corpus protected the least of us from the greatest, the humble subject or citizen from her king or president. It let her go to court and force whoever was holding her to give an explanation in law. The English roots of this writ run back to Edward I. It protected American sailors against impressment by British seamen. It protected soldiers in the American Civil War. It was the only way for Japanese Americans to protest their illegal internment during the Second World War. But last year, a pliant and docile Congress, a parliament of mice, acted to abolish a judicial review that's been a hallmark of freedom for seven centuries, all with the evident purpose of keeping Adel's case, and so many cases like his, a secret. So he's there tonight. He'll be there when you wake up in the morning and in the next day and the next. His case demonstrates it doesn't matter whether they are enemy combatants or not. It doesn't matter whether the military tribunals clear them or whether they don't. They sit in prison at the president's pleasure anyway. But the Uyghurs, they come from a part of Central Asia quite unfamiliar to most of us, a very beautiful part of the world, but a part of the world most of us can't find on a map and have never been to and will never go to. And so maybe a few of us are willing to forget that these Uyghurs have families. Pictured is Adel's family. Uh, this is a photograph that we sent to the base many months ago, but you are seeing what he has never seen because, it's, you see, it hasn't been cleared for security purposes. Adele, just like you, may have a son or a daughter cute as a button. Another photograph he's never seen. Just like you, he may long for the clatter of a family meal. But as long as he's far away at Guantanamo, and he's a Uyghur, and we've never heard of them. Maybe we don't need to care. And you might ask, why care about this? Is one little habeas case about people nobody's ever heard of going to make a difference? Is it going to change anything? <clears throat> During the Vietnam War, a protester stood outside the White House with a candle every night for weeks. He stood in the cold. He stood in the rain. One day, a reporter came up to him and said, do you really think with your candle you're going to change White House policy? No, he said. I'm sure I won't. Well, the reporter asked, why are you doing this? 
he said, so that White House policy doesn't change me. The truth is, we're all responsible for Guantanamo, personally responsible. That's what democracy means. It's the civic expression of what we lawyers call the law of principle and agent. You and I are responsible if at Bagram Air Base they murder a taxi driver called Dilawar by hanging him from his arms, or if at Abu Ghraib they leer at naked men stacked like cordwood, if at Guantanamo they leave a man in solitary until he tears the hair from his scalp, if they ship people to Egypt to be tortured, and we don't do anything to stop it, we might as well have done it ourselves. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold, Yates wrote. The best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. And I think that's the problem. The best lack all conviction. We launch invasions for transparent lies, and the best avert their eyes. We watch our young men and women killed and maimed every day, and the best do not demand an end now. A habeas corpus judge rules that innocent men are held at Guantanamo, and eight days later the Congress abolishes habeas corpus. The best lack all conviction. That's the problem. The rule of law isn't coming back on its own. It will only come back when the best get conviction again, when you go out and grab hold of it by the ears and drag it back kicking and screaming in the ballot box, in the courtroom, and on the blogs, in the classroom, and the public street. When's it coming back? Only when you answer the question, who's at Guantanamo, with the truth. I am and you are. Until we shut it down, it imprisons all of us. One last thing. When I visited Guantanamo last in January, on the way into Camp 5 to meet a client, I saw big construction cranes against the sky. You see, they're building Camp 6. Our next speaker is Thomas Wilner. Thomas Wilner is the managing partner of the International Trade Litigation, Trade and Government Relations Practice of Sherman and Sterling, an international law firm with 19 offices and business centers around the world. During more than 30 years of practicing law, Mr. Wilner has represented private and governmental clients, including the government of Mexico, the government of Venezuela, and the organization of the petroleum exporting countries. In major cases before the United States courts, before Congress, and before the U.S. executive branch. On May 1st, 2002, he filed a case in U.S. court on behalf of the Kuwaiti citizens detained at Guantanamo Bay seeking basic due process. This was one of the very first cases ever filed on behalf of detainees in Guantanamo. He was lead counsel to the Kuwaitis in the landmark case, Rasul versus Bush, decided in June 2004, in which the Supreme Court ruled that detainees at Guantanamo have the right to challenge the legality of their detentions in U.S. court under the writ of habeas corpus. Since that decision, he has been to Guantanamo 10 times to meet with his clients. Mr. Wilner is a graduate of Yale University and the University of Pennsylvania Law School, where he was editor of the Law Review. Please join me in welcoming Thomas Wilner. Damon, is it okay if I close this? Thank you. I won't be nearly as eloquent as Sabin. I have just written down a few notes here. Um, and what I'd like to do is talk to you a bit about the history of the case and then encourage questions. Let me start out, though, by saying that um, I congratulate the forum for putting this on. I think it's terribly important, and I think it's great that you all are here. I can't help but say that after being in this for four years, I am disappointed in our country that it is only you who are here. I mean, our country and I, you know, we're, we're sitting in a place where democracy was born and the country was born. 
What's happening at Guantanamo is the most fundamental violation of our principles, and the country seems not to care. And it makes me sad every time I see it. So I congratulate you for being here, but it's, it's, it's disheartening to me. Um, let me tell you the history of the case. I was contacted in March of 2002 by some Kuwaiti families whose kids were missing, really. Uh, they thought they had been picked up. Most of them had been in the Pakistan-Afghanistan area. Let me back up, too, and, uh, because a lot of people don't recognize it. Pac uh, Afghanistan at that time, 2001, was, it, was one of the great international disaster areas. It had gone through years and years of civil war, three severe droughts. The educational system was gone. Uh, the health care system was gone. People were starving. And there was a great need for charitable services there. Because the area was so difficult, uh, the people who provided most of those charitable services were from the Middle East. Uh, this is actually a fact. My clients from Kuwait, Kuwait is a very wealthy country. They preached to everyone that you should go out and help other people. I will tell you that my clients are there have a history every year during their vacation period. They would go from one country to another and, and do charitable work. In any event, uh, they were down there at the time. Six of them are teachers. The other uh, had jobs and were down there during their vacation. Um, their families contacted me. And uh, I do a lot of work in Washington, and I have uh, connections in Washington. Not so good in this administration, but better before. And um, I tried to find out where they were, and I was told by my contacts that we're not going to tell you anything. I went over to Kuwait in April 2002 to meet with the families to do a sort of due diligence to see what the families were like. They were all very good people. Uh, when I of course, that doesn't mean anything. All of us could have terrible sons or daughters who can do horrible things, um, although my kids are good. <laughs> but anyway, um, while we were there, the U.S. government told the government of Kuwait that eight of these 12, or the 12 families, had been taken to Guantanamo. The Red Cross told us that the other four were there. Uh, we also found out while we were there, it's the first time the, the bounty leaflet that Sabin read is something that we discovered back then in the uh, beginning of 2002. We heard stories that these people had been sold for bounties. Actually, there's a Newsweek story all the way back in July 2002 in an ABC report reporting on five of my, my Kuwaiti clients who were invited to the house of a Pakistani tribal leader and then sold to the United States for $5,000 to $25,000 each. It's all been reported. It doesn't come out. We decided uh, to file a case uh, for relief in the U.S. courts. We filed in May 1, 2002. We asked for the very minimum relief. What we asked for was basic due process. We didn't even ask that they be released, but just that they be given a fair hearing. And um, let me, I think it's important because it, it shows what's gone wrong. Um, I believe that a government whether there's a war or not in a dangerous time, has got to have the ability to capture and detain dangerous people. I don't think we should really dispute that. The real issue is that there's got to be some system for distinguishing those who are dangerous from those who are not. That's really what our case has always been about, some fair hearing to distinguish that, and they've never had it. So while our opponents always say that we're trying to extend legal protections to terrorists, that's so stupid. We're not trying to do that. We're trying to have a fair process to determine whether they're terrorists or not. That is the basis, the essence of the rule of law. Ever since the time of the Magna Carta, the Magna Carta in 1215 was an agreement with Prince John saying that no person may be deprived of his liberty uh, except by a jury of his peers in the law of the land. The writ of habeas corpus, I don't know how many people are lawyers, but all it does is guarantee that basic element of law, that the king can't pick up somebody and hold them without review by some impartial, independent person to see whether there's basis for it, whether it's held according to law. Now, a lot of people, a lot of people say, well, you know, you don't do that during wartime. And a lot of our opponents will say, well, you know, we didn't do this in World War II with all the Germans and Japanese we captured. That's really a silly point. Because at that time, 
when you captured a German or a Japanese during World War II, they were wearing a uniform and you knew they were an enemy combatant. The problem came up when we got into other wars like Vietnam, when you would capture people dressed like civilians. And may I say, the, the administration has said these are bad guys because they're dressed like civilians. If that's so, I look out at the audience and I see a lot of bad people. But clearly not everyone dressed like a civilian is a bad person. You've got to have some process to distinguish. And the Geneva Conventions provides a process. It says if you capture somebody and there's doubt about them, you have a hearing. Army regulations developed during Vietnam really have this very explicitly. They say if there's any doubt about your person you capture, it's, by the way, it's Army Regulation 190-8, which applies to all the services. It says you have a hearing. You have a hearing promptly in the field to determine whether the person is an enemy combatant, whether they're an enemy, and if so, what their status should be. Should they have prisoner of war status or are they a bad guy, a, you know, a partisan who's, who's out of uniform doing things? We did that in the last Gulf War. I mean, it's a statistic that comes out. We had 1,200 of these individual hearings. In three-quarters of those cases, the people were found to be picked up by mistake. They were innocent bystanders picked up by mistake, and they were released. The other quarter were found to be prisoners of war, legal combatants. The key thing that happened at Guantanamo is the government never had these hearings. People were turned over for bounties. Um, and, you know, as Saban said, 5% were captured by the United States. The rest were turned in by the Northern Alliance or Pakistan for huge bounties. The government got all these people, and they just shipped them to Guantanamo. They did some sifting themselves but never had any hearing. And that's really all we've ever been asking for in this. Um, so we filed our case in May 1st, 2002. The government moved to dismiss, and I'll just go through the history of it. The government's argument was these are foreigners and they're outside the United States so they have no rights and they have no right to go to court. Now, I, I got to tell you to start with, that's why they took them to Guantanamo, of course. Uh, Guantanamo, and when we went to the Supreme Court, we found a paper in the files that was published that said, why Gitmo? Why did we take them to Guantanamo? And it was really very explicit. They were afraid if they took them to the United States, they can go to court. If they took them to another country, they could go to the courts of that country. They said, if we take them to Guantanamo, you know, it's really part of Cuba, but we control it completely, they can't go to court. So by doing this, we could avoid any impediment of legal review, which is an incredible motivation, which I'll get back to. Guantanamo uh, is a base in Cuba, where I've been actually 12 times now, uh, it's 45 square miles in the southeast corner of Cuba, separated by a bay. It was taken over by the United States after the Spanish-American War when we really freed Cuba. We set up the republic, and then we entered into a lease for this place. The lease with Guant for Guantanamo says that while Cuba retains ultimate sovereignty over the place, uh, which I've always thought means they'll get it back once we leave, during the lease, the United States has complete jurisdiction and control. And the lease is in perpetuity. As long as the United States wants to remain there, it can remain there and have total control over it. Anyway, the government filed its motion to dismiss because these are foreigners outside the United States. The district court accepted their argument, and the Court of Appeals accepted the argument as well. We went, then went to the Supreme Court. I don't know how many lawyers are, are here, but you don't just get to go to the Supreme Court. First, you need to petition them to take the case. And uh, at that time, with Gita's help, uh, we petitioned the Supreme Court for certiorari. Um, and it's sort of interesting. We, at that time, we got briefs in support. We had two strategies. We got briefs in support of our position from um, prominent ex-federal judges, from the heads of the judge advocate general, the former judge advocate generals of the Navy, indeed the guy who had been Judge Advocate General of the Navy when Guantanamo, when the people were first taken to Guantanamo. Then we did it from ex-POWs who thought this was a bad thing, from diplomats. And I don't know whether you heard the case, um, it's the very famous case when uh, people of Japanese descent were rounded up during World War II. The famous case was brought by a fellow named Fred Korematsu. Uh, Fred Korematsu filed an amicus brief in our favor. We also made two arguments, two basic arguments to the Supreme Court. 
Uh, the first is that if you really allow the executive branch to do this, you're, you're destroying our whole system of separated powers in the Constitution. You are allowing, you are allowing the administration, simply by, by taking somebody outside the United States to cut off court review. That couldn't be what mattered. You're really allowing the executive branch to define the jurisdiction of the judiciary, something that irritates judges. Um, the other, I think, point that we made the most, and I think had a lot of effect with the court, is that the United States, which has been the beacon around the world for the rule of law, and has tried to establish throughout the world the idea that nobody can be deprived of his liberty without some independent review. If the United States throws this away, we are becoming an international outlier. And I will tell you, a lot of Supreme Court justices, unlike Scalia when he goes places and, and yells in Switzerland, get very embarrassed when their international colleagues criticize them for that. In any event, um, we made an another argument, too, which I am always very proud of, but um, I found out through an interview with CBS, uh, we weren't allowed to go to Guantanamo at the time, but that the iguanas at Guantanamo are protected. If you're a, an iguana in Guantanamo, you can't be killed because if you are, you'll, vi you'll, you'll violate U.S. law. As soon as a poor iguana gets off the base in Guantanamo into Cuba, he's eaten. So they come into Guantanamo. So we also made the argument, you know, how is it that U.S. law can protect the iguanas and not the people being held down there? and was quoted back to us during oral argument. Um, in any event, in June, on June 28th of, last, of 2004, the Supreme Court ruled in our favor, and it said that these people at Guantanamo, no less than American citizens, have the right to test the legality of their detention before the U.S. courts. It also pointed out that the writ of habeas corpus, the right to independent review, extends to these people and really is something basic, uh, was well established by the time the colonies gained independence, and it would have extended to these people. We thought that was a great victory. We, the next day, we petitioned to go to Guantanamo to meet with our clients. I think it's interesting because just to say what the government did after that, the first reaction was, although these people may have the right to go to court, they don't have the right to lawyers. So they went back to court. As a matter of fact, stopped us from going to Guantanamo. I think Guido went first before I did, because they said that the right to lawyers, they didn't have a right, the government would allow them to have lawyers, but with my clients, only if they monitored our conversations and eavesdropped on them. I said, you know, you can't have lawyer-client communications that way. So we went back to court, and it took us until October of 2004 to win before the lower courts the right that our people had the right to lawyers. Um, then, after we won that, the government filed another motion in court. It said, courts, you've got to dismiss this case because even if these people have the right to go into court, once they go into court, because they're foreigners outside the United States, they have no rights to enforce, so you've got to throw them out of court. By that time, there were then 13 cases filed by the time uh, the government did this. Uh, they were split into one very conservative judge held for the government. So everything was stayed again. We argued that before the Court of Appeals, this issue, whether we have a right to go forward, and it's, a, it's an interesting legal issue I won't bore you with. We said whether or not we have constitutional rights, we have the right to independent review through habeas corpus. We argued that to the Court of Appeals on September 8th, and I think everybody said we won an oral argument. Uh, shortly after that, the administration went to the Senate and to Senator Lindsey Graham from South Carolina, who then introduced an amendment as part of the Defense Appropriations Act for this year that stripped the right of habeas corpus from anyone at Guantanamo. That's what Saban mentioned. As a matter of fact, it was really disgraceful because it went through as part of the McCain Amendment. Uh, Senator McCain went through and said, let's forbid torture. And the Senate said, let's forbid torture, and then they took the right away any right for anybody to go to court in Guantanamo and enforce that right. Um, so that was passed on December 22nd by the Senate and the House. It was signed into law on December 30th by the President. We just argued last week before the Court of Appeals as to whether that act 
applies to our cases which are pending before the courts are just to future cases. But this went through and um, that that's where the cases stand now. We're waiting for a decision. Let me, um, let me just say two consequences and then sit down. Four years after we filed our case, more than four years after these people have been in Guantanamo, almost two years after the Supreme Court ruled on our favor, they still haven't had a hearing. It's amazing. They still haven't had a hearing. I can talk about what I've seen in the torture and everything else, but that's amazing. Um, also, I really think Guantanamo has become a centerpiece in the problem of everything that's happened. Remember what I said, why Gitmo? Why did they take them to Guantanamo? Uh, the government took them to Guantanamo purposely to avoid the law. It said if we take people out, these foreigners outside the country, we don't need to pay attention to the law. The law is an impediment to be avoided. That created, I think, through the government, it's an attitude we've seen in all sorts of memoranda from the government, but a culture of illegality. Um, the law was something to be avoided. All the torture things you've seen at Abu Ghraib, and I can tell you every place where my people have been under U.S. control, they were terribly abused, is a result of this sort of culture of illegality. You know, we haven't talked about it. It's devastating for our own principles, but it's devastating for our standing in the world community. I represent Kuwaitis. The Kuwaitis, the, the popularity of the United States four years ago in Kuwait was over 80 percent. We had freed the country from Saddam Hussein. Today it's, it's below 20 percent. Part of that, I guess, is Iraq, although in Kuwait they hated Saddam Hussein. The biggest thing is, I think, the hypocrisy of the United States is, as we stand before the world. One of my uh, clients, Fauzi al Oda, who was on hunger strike for five weeks until he was brutally forced to stop his hunger strike. I, I asked him for a BBC interview, which we uh, did, since the reporters aren't allowed down there, only we are. I said, you know, how do you feel about the United States? How did you feel about it? How do you feel today? And he said, you know, my whole life, uh, my friends and myself looked up to the United States as the model of everything we wanted to be. They stood for fairness and justice. He said, you know, sometimes they're a little rich and arrogant, but they're the good guys. I said, how do you feel now? And he looked at me and said, you know, and he had spent time in the United States. He said, I just can't believe the American people know what's happening. So that's the story of Guantanamo. Thanks. Our final speaker tonight, uh, Gita Gutierrez, is an attorney with the Center for Constitutional Rights, a New York-based human rights organization litigating extensive challenges to the executive's post-9-11 anti-terrorism policies. Um, I think that it's very fair to say without the Center for Constitutional Rights and just a few organizations and a few very brave attorneys who stepped up early on, we would not have the facts today to even have this meeting and have this discussion. Um, it is my personal belief that there is a great debt of, at, of gratitude um, owed by the American people to the Center for Constitutional Rights. Um, Ms. Gutierrez was a member of the legal team representing Guantanamo detainees and Rasul versus Bush before the United States Supreme Court in 2004. Following their victory in Rasul, she represented two British citizens detained in Guantanamo and conducted the very first visit by a habeas attorney to citizens in, det, uh, detained in Guantanamo in September 2004. Since that time, she has met with clients frequently at the military prison and is involved in the current habeas litigation safeguarding the rights of these men. In September 2005, she co-authored a report on the prisoner protest at Guantanamo, the, prisoner, the Guantanamo prisoner hunger strikes and protests February 2002 to August 2005. Ms. Gutierrez graduated from Cornell Law School, where she also taught international human rights and terrorism. Thank you.
and please help me in welcoming her. Thank you. It's a, a great pleasure to be here. Um, I just want to pick up first with saying that it, it does mean a lot to have you be here. In the late 2001, when the Center for Constitutional Rights was contacted by families from the United Kingdom and from Australia who had discovered that their sons and husbands were in Guantanamo, they had been turned down by many organizations and many lawyers when they were seeking representation. Um, it's understandable to me that that happened, and it's also, I think, incredibly tragic. Um, at that time, the Bush administration was saying that these were the worst of the worst, and all of the men in Guantanamo were al-Qaeda terrorists, and most nonprofit human rights organizations and many, many lawyers were afraid or uncomfortable or not ready to represent these men. The wounds of September 11th were still too raw. We actually at the center also debated what the impact would be and whether or not to take these cases. We, unlike many civil liberties organizations, do not represent ideas, but represent individuals. And this was one of the rare times in the history of our organization when we took on the representation of individuals whose politics we did not agree with at the time based on our impression from the administration of who was in Guantanamo. But we realized that the system of detention outside the law in Guantanamo violated so many fundamental principles of law, not just within this country, but internationally, that we could not turn our backs on these families. So the representation began and the habeas petition was filed in February of 2002. We have learned many years later that that was indeed the right step and that the clients that we represented were not al-Qaeda terrorists. My involvement with CCR began when they were at an appellate stage and working through the cert petition in the United States Supreme Court, and I worked with them as a volunteer lawyer and then later came on as a staff attorney. I want to talk briefly about what that first meeting at Guantanamo was like. Um, it, is, it is hard to take us back a year and a half, two years ago, to a period of time when we didn't know anything about these men. And as, as Mr. Wilner said, we knew their families, we knew what we were being told, uh, but I think as, as any um, hardened or even novice lawyer knows, you don't really know who your client is until you actually sit in the room with him or her and not his or her mother or his or her father. So that first visit occurred in September 2004, and it was originally scheduled for four clients, two of my clients and two other lawyers far senior to me who were working on other cases were scheduled to go down. We had fought since June 28, 2004 to get down to the base. We had to go to court. We had to get the judges involved in order just to get access to our client. And eventually three of us were able to go down to the base in the beginning of September. We bought our tickets and wrangled with the Department of Defense to deal with the logistics of the visit, and were prepared to go, leaving on Saturday and Sunday on different flights. The Friday, right before that weekend, we had a status conference in Washington, D.C. with the judge, and the Department of Defense changed the rules of the game. They altered the rules for the visit in a way that was prejudicial to the other two cases, and those two attorneys decided not to go. Um, my firm that I was working with in the center thought that it would be fine for me to go um, by myself, although I was, um, certainly don't have the years of experience that um, my colleagues here at this table have or the attorneys who were planning on going down on the visit with me. But we all thought it would be fine because we'd be having a group. Uh, that did not turn out to be the case. Um, I had already written the two clients I was going to visit and had heard back from one of them and felt at that point our team made a decision that we could not just not show up after all of these years, and so I went alone. I went to go visit two British citizens, Moizem Beg and Feroz Abbasi. Moizem and his wife had moved from the United Kingdom to Afghanistan to begin a school for girls and boys. His wife was going to teach the girls, Moizem was going to teach the boys. Um, they moved there with their three small children, and we're, we're waiting for the permits from the Taliban government to begin their school um, when September 11th hit. 
and they stayed in Afghanistan. When the bombing started, they fled, um, and when things got too chaotic, they fled across to Pakistan, rented a flat, and reestablished themselves. They contacted Muslim's father back in Birmingham and let him know they were safe. On January 31st, 2002, um, officials burst into their home in the middle of the night, woke up Muslim, woke up his wife, threw him into the trunk of a car, and his family did not hear from him or see from him for a number of weeks. Um, he was able to have um, a quick phone call with his father because he, had his, he grabbed his cell phone. So from the trunk of a car, he called his father and, you know, and said, Papa, get my wife out of Pakistan, get them back. I don't know what's going on. They've captured me. They've taken me. And eventually his family learned that he was sent to Bagram and detained there for a year. Um, I think many of you are probably familiar with the kinds of interrogation tactics and the conditions of detention in Bagram. Muslim is one of the individuals that stayed there the longest. He was then sent, after a false confession was extracted to him, he was sent to Guantanamo Bay and housed in Camp Echo for nearly two years before I met him. And Camp Echo is a series of small huts that are isolation units. He lived in a windowless, tiny cell for almost two years before I met him. The other client that I met um, is Froze Abbasi, who is actually almost exactly 10 years younger than me to the day. Um, he, uh, we knew very little about him. He had been somewhat out of touch and estranged from his family for a year. I didn't know what he would be like. I didn't know if because he was younger than Muslim and wasn't married and didn't have a family, if he might be slightly more conservative. Um, I did not know his politics. He was a wild card. So I got to Guantanamo, and the morning before going in and to meet with those clients, I, uh, we, when, we, when any of the attorneys are at the base, we have a military escort with us all the time. Because it was the first visit, a lawyer from the Department of Defense General Counsel's office accompanied me, so he was there. And we were sitting at breakfast, and in the minute I hit the base, the rules again started changing. Um, the way that they would handle the attorney notes, the confidentiality of the meetings, uh, everything started being changed, and I had to fight all the way up until the moment when we were ready to leave for the camp. And at some point that morning, I walked away from the general counsel, a lawyer from the Department of Defense, and I walked away from the escort, and I stopped for a moment, and I simply prayed. And I prayed for strength and clarity and openness and the ability to be present for the two men I was about to meet and to be present for the situation I was about to walk into. We then boarded a bus that took us to a ferry that took us across the bay, got on another bus, got on a series of identification badges, and then drove across the base to the detention center. We then went through several checkpoints and finally got out and walked through layers of razor wire and gates until finally we were in the small little area, not much bigger than this hall that constituted at that time Camp Echo. And I was shown and pointed to the little hut where Mozambique was going to be. My escort walked me to the door and the door was opened. And I don't think there's been a time in my life when I have felt more acutely aware of everything happening around me um, and more frightened. The door opened and there was Mozambique, um, who in his former life has had legal training and is a bookshop owner and does look like he owns a bookshop. It's a small, slight man with his Guantanamo-issued glasses, sitting very um, straight with all of his papers laid out in front of him that we had sent him and an enormous smile on his face. And the moment I saw him, I knew that we had made the right decision to come. And I sat and talked with Muslim that week, and he had no idea what had been going on in the world. He thought the world had forgotten about him. And this was in September 2004. I explained to him that his father, Asmat Beg, had become an international advocate against the policies in Guantanamo, had traveled to the United States, had been um, to other European countries and certainly within the UK and had fought on his behalf, that there were protests internationally about what had been going on in Guantanamo, and it was emotionally draining and uh, stunning and very hopeful for Mozam. The other client then that I met that afternoon was Feroz Abbasi, and I almost didn't go in to meet Feroz because the way the rules had changed, if we didn't get these men to sign a piece of paper saying that, yes, indeed, they wanted us to represent them, as far as the Department of Defense was concerned, their legal case was over. 
And without having heard from Feroz, I was concerned that I would walk in, that he would not be willing to sign a piece of paper, and that his case would be over. But I met him that, after, that afternoon, and when I walked in to see him, it's a very, very tall young man, and he too had papers laid out in front of him, including a set of four letters that he had written us with his grievances and legal concerns that had never been given to us as his lawyers. And Feroz told me that he, he and Moizem were actually housed next to each other with a solid wall, but had never seen one another. They knew there was a British citizen on the other side of the, that wall, but they had never spoken or talked. Um, Feroz could hear us a little bit in the morning, so he knew I was at the base. And he had um, either gone out for recreation or taken a shower, and he was terribly concerned that he had missed his visit and was very, very nervous. Um, so when I walked in, he was incredibly relieved and started um, immediately going over the things that had happened to him in the hands of the United States military and going over the letters that he had been sending us um, over and over, copies um, that the military had never delivered. Both of these men had been charged, uh, had de been deemed eligible for a military commission, although they had not been charged. They were some of the few in Guantanamo who'd been labeled the worst of the worst. Um, with Mozem, we now believe it was a case of mistaken identity because he, his nickname was the same nickname as an um, alleged trainer in some of the Al-Qaeda military camps. And with Feroz, he, um, his case and documents from him are all over the Internet. He had a valid claim as a prisoner of war, but certainly was not a terrorist by any sense of the word and is not a violent individual. Um, they could not be tried before a military commission because of the position of the United Kingdom that they felt that the military commission processes were unfair. So they were caught in this legal limbo. And after having legal representation and the truth of their stories come out, um, I was very, very lucky to be um, one of the few attorneys, and, and Mr. Wilner's one of these as well, who have actually had clients released from Guantanamo. Um, their release was announced in January 2005, and I spent the week with Feroz um, before he went home sitting in those cells in Camp Echo, um, with him being relatively terrified to believe it was true that he was actually going to be sent home. Um, and it wasn't until I was able to confirm through the British Embassy, not any agency or government official in the United States, but through the British Embassy that, yes, indeed, there had been a date set for their return home, that he was actually able to believe a little bit that he would go home. Um, and it was... Um, one of the most moving experiences of my life to get the phone call from him once he was back in his mother's ho house. Um, they were flown in mid-January. They were flown um, back to the United Kingdom. They spent, both he and Mozem and um, the other British citizens, although the British residents are still in Guantanamo, they were flown back to the United Kingdom. They spent one night in jail, were questioned for 45 minutes the next day in the presence of their lawyer, and were sent home to their families. Although they've had their passport taken away, Moizem is back with his wife and with a, um, a child that was born after his wife was pregnant when he was taken to Guantanamo, so he had a child he had never seen, which is not an uncommon situation. So he met his son for the first time, and he's back with his wife and family. He actually just has a, a book that came out in the beginning of March about his time in U.S. custody. Froze, I'm happy to say, um, is now doing a year-long kind of transitional university course, and we'll be starting college in the fall. Um, and so he's become a library rat um, and is uh, studying quite well. Both of them um, live with the fear of the police coming and kidnapping them or knocking on their door. Um, they both suffer from post-traumatic stress syndrome, sleeplessness, and um, Moizem has spoken quite eloquently about um, the difficulties he has with reconnecting with his family and trying to be gentle with them after what he's been through. And I just want to close briefly with, with talking about why did this happen to Moizem and Feroz? How could the United States government, the United States military, keep these two men and almost 800 others like them in prison in Guantanamo and impact their families, their wives and parents and children this way as well. And I just want to say that when our president makes a decision and our government makes a, makes a decision to act outside the law, it shows us the ugly, ugly side of our country. 
And we sit in this hall right now and we, we invoke the freedom and liberty and the principles of justice and Anglo-American law that our country has been founded upon. But the so-called war on terror and our president's decision to act as a tyrant has showed us what lies beneath principles of liberty and justice and lawfulness. When we abandon these, we allow our basest instincts to govern our country. We have always had an underbelly of injustice, and Mr. Willett went through um, a history of terror. We also have a history of injustice in this country. We have gone through the age of slavery. We intern Japanese Americans. To this day, we suffer from the way that we treat the poor or how we deal with racial issues in our own country now. But we have always had a constitution. We have always had our laws, and we've always had principles that we at least hold up and say, this is not who we want to be. It may be our underbelly, it may be our fear and our basest ways of interacting, but we don't embrace it. We at least will say that we want to be a country of justice and lawfulness. That is changing. And that's what I find most disturbing about Guantanamo and what is happening to the men and the families there, is that as a nation now, we are acting from a place of fear and choosing to have as a national policy a practice of torture. And not just the kind of things that we've seen from the photos from Abu Ghraib, but the fact that we would kidnap a man and put him in a prison like Guantanamo and cut him off from his family and leave him in indefinite detention, that alone amounts and constitutes torture. It is having a devastating psychological impact on the men and their families. And as a nation, this is our official policy now. We have um, allowed an attorney general to be appointed who was part of that. We have re-elected, and some would dispute that, a president who has um, committed war crimes as a policy of our country. It is, it is a time to act, not just to listen. And there are many things that each of you can do as individuals. Um, there are materials from Amnesty on the back table. There is an action center on the Center for Constitutional Rights website. Um, the passage of the Detainee Treatment Act, we allowed that to happen as a country. And we cannot continue on this path. The last time I was at Guantanamo, I met a client for the first time. Um, it's a, another lawyer's client who has not gotten permission to go to the base, so I took his information down and met his client and acted as a, um, a messenger. And the client looked at me and he said, he, he wanted to know, how, how could you do this? So I started saying, well, our president has this policy. He views the war on terror. He's like, no, how could you do this? And I said, well, you know, the American people. And then I stopped and he said, how could you do this? And it caught me, and I stopped, and I said, I'm sorry. I apologize on behalf of my country, and I'm sorry. And many of the lawyers going down today, we are fighting as hard as we can in court, and we are apologizing as humanly and sincerely as we can at that base, and in the home countries with the families. It is a policy that will not end unless we act. I think that what is happening in Guantanamo is something that will spread. We are now seeing um, environmentalists who are labeled eco-terrorists being charged under terrorism laws. This is not a uh, practice that will stop at Guantanamo. And I don't want to, for those of you that have seen um, the movie V for Vendetta, I don't want to invoke the specter of that. But I do want to say that this is not an aberration and it is not isolated. It is something that if you disagree with it, it is time to act and speak up now um, and recognize that it is not just our Muslim brothers and sisters that are being affected by this either within the United States or without, but it's also other groups that are um, engaged in dissent and who um, are speaking up and engaging in the kinds of uh, free speech and activism and freedom that this country has truly been founded on that we need to preserve. Thank you.
I want to thank again our speakers for all of their comments and, and the information they have given to us tonight and invite anyone who has questions that they would like to address to any member of the panel to come to the microphone. We have about, would you say, about 20 minutes of questions or so. Um, and so if you could come, and we do ask that you, you please ask a question uh, and let us know um, which member of the panel you would like to address it to. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bill Haney. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you, not just for speaking tonight, but for all that you're doing to kind of be an act of redemption for the rest of us. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, for one, am very grateful. My question, I guess it's very difficult listening to these stories and um, having an opportunity to hear more about this to understand the motives behind the administration's decision making. I mean, the notion that they act from fear, okay, that they gather people in. Why is it that they're, in your opinion, and frankly, I'm interested in any one of your opinions, maybe I'll let you, um, our gracious moderator, choose. Um, it strikes me that there's a level of malevolence behind all this. I mean, it's kind of brutal, um, cruel, and malevolent, you know, almost institutionalized malevolence. It doesn't seem to serve a purpose. Um, if they were here now, how would they defend their behavior? What, on what principle would you imagine they would defend their behavior? Um, I I mean, certainly you can read in the newspapers or you can read in the legal pleadings the kind of principles that are being evoked. And the um, you know, straightforward answer would be that our president is commander-in-chief of the country and our, we're, at a, we're in a war and um, it's his responsibility to protect the national security. And these are new tools that the president needs against a new threat. Um, I don't buy any of that. Um, I don't think that our current threat of terrorism is any different than the kinds of threats that we faced for a long time. Um, I, M Mr. Willett pointed out that they are still building in Guantanamo, and so I think there's a couple of motivations or a couple of benefits that the administration and others get out of the war on terror. One, you have um, enormous oil resources in countries that are governed by Muslim Arabs, and there are, I think, some motivations there to gain a stronghold in those countries, um, and feeding the war on terror helps that. Guantanamo has also always been a smokescreen. Um, by picking up men, Muslim and Arab men, all over the world and taking them to Guantanamo and keeping it as a place of secrecy and isolation, we haven't known the truth about them. So a lot of focus has been on Guantanamo. Um, in the November 2005, Human Rights Watch and um, several major newspapers started issuing information about the CIA black sites. And frankly, members of al-Qaeda who are caught are not taken to Guantanamo. They are taken to secret detention facilities in the custody of the CIA and interrogated under fairly brutal regimes. Um, and that's where those people are. By having the focus on Guantanamo, it's taken a much, much, much longer time for um, people like um, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the Center for Constitutional Rights to turn our focus on places like that. Um, and I'll let well, Tom let me Let me just say, because it's a good question, we speculate about motives. I think I'm a Washingtonian, and I've been involved in politics a lot. Um, I think when people started out with this, it was the thing, we need to be tough, and we need to break the rules, we need to do whatever is necessary, let's take off the gloves. Um, there's lots of things that have happened since then. Part of the reason people are still at Guantanamo, people are just afraid to sign the release papers. Nobody wants to take the heat for it. Then there's a more subtle thing, and, and we've seen it in the election. I mean, there have been polls done by the administration, by the people in charge, and they know that their base doesn't care at all how you treat these people in Guantanamo. Indeed, if you're promoting yourself based on your toughness, being nice here and being reasonable doesn't help you politically. So that's the malevolent part. There's a conscious decision made that being tough and unfair and un-American is actually helpful politically. Thank you for your question. Hello. Good evening. My name is Frank Davis, and actually my question is somewhat of a follow-up on the answer you just gave. 
Uh, each of you has been using the legal system in an attempt to satisfy your clients' needs. But we all know that there is a political component to this as well. Would each of you share with us who you feel is on your side, if you will, and who, by name, is on the other side or the administration side? Can I just address this? Because this is why, and then everyone can. But one of my great angers here, we, you know, George Bush is adult, but he's been allowed to get away with this. I mean, I want to name some people by names. I'm here in a blue state in the bluest of blue states. I'm disgusted with John Kerry. I will tell you something, that the reason this bill passed is because, I, you know, the bill that's stripping jurisdiction came up there. I mean, we should all know this is uh, – there was a bill put up by Senator Bingaman and Senator Durbin and Senator Levin to strip out the jurisdiction stripping part. John Kerry and Hillary Clinton went up and said, we don't know whether we could support it because it won't give us cover for being tough on terrorism. They, they are responsible. The responsible people are the Democratic Party that hasn't stood up for principle, John Kerry and Hillary Clinton being chief among them. And I, so I, I really think the problem, even here sitting in a blue state, is to push these people to stand up what we should believe for. They're the problem more than anyone else. That's my venting. Here, here. Uh, Tom is absolutely right. One of the great frustrations that we've had is that the party that ought to be standing up and calling a spade a spade won't do it. I mean, the other day John Dean was quoted saying, Gee, I think this is the first president to ever confess to an impeachable offense. Speaking of the uh, disobedience to the, uh, the, the FISA rules. And how many senators would even censure him? One. So I, I agree entirely with Tom. It's a mistake to simply blame the Republicans for this. In fact, what we have to do is start blaming Democrats for not acting like Democrats. Thank you very much, albeit your talks have depressed me even further. Uh, but I see individual lawyers fighting a good fight. What about the organizations you belong to? Don't they stand for something? Where is their rage? Thank you. Where's the what? Can you clarify what uh, well, For example, the ABA. Where are they? Well, the ABA has. <laughs> to, I mean, look, I'll tell you the truth. Gita talked about this. When we first got involved four years ago, I, I mean, it was no big thing to us not, because this is what lawyers should do. They should stand up for this. It took a long time for the legal community to come around. Not that long, though. I'd say now, overwhelmingly, the legal community is on our side. The ABA has taken, made statements about this. They filed briefs on our behalf. Um, so they're coming around. Um, you know, what still bothers me is what about everyone else? I go at the parties. I mean, this country is running concentration camps now. Mm -hmm. I have images of Germany in the 1930s when people knew the economy is going great. Let's have a drink and everything, and things are happening, but let's turn it back. What's happened to the press? I mean, the stories I've told about, the stories we've talked about, about, you know, people being sold for bounties, people being innocent, they're out there, but there's no follow-up. I mean, I will tell you, when I started doing this, we first had a 60-minute show that was going to do it. CBS killed it because it was too political. What's happened to our country? I mean, everybody should be out screaming, I think. Excuse me for getting passionate about it, but I, I agree. Well, both of the uh, questions, I'm Jim Margolis from Brookline. Both of the questions I came to ask have been uh, asked and answered. Uh, I, too, am appalled that so few of us are here. The last time I walked in late to one of these, whatever it was, I don't remember, a couple of months ago, a Ford Hall Forum, the place was packed. I think there is nothing worse that we are doing than the torture and the indefinite uh, detention, and uh, this is appalling. 
but thank you so much for everything you're saying. Okay, well, it's very clear we all need to cheer up a little bit. So I'm going to tell you all a happy story. <laughs> this, this actually happened at Guantanamo. This will only take a second. I was recently asked by my church to talk about the idea of loving your enemy. In, if some of you are Christians, you know that uh, on the sermon, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus doesn't say, be nice to your enemy or treat him under the Geneva Conventions. He actually says, love him, which is a hard thing to do. So I said, well, I was worried about that before I went to Guantanamo, but God let me off the hook because it turns out he's not my enemy. But I actually did see one day this principle in action. <clears throat> we have an interpreter uh, who's only half cleared. It's very hard to find Uyghur interpreters. And so we have to go with a government minder from the Department of Defense. Adel is always very glad to see us and greets us with bear hugs, complete with the Uyghur head tap side to side. So there we are one morning, me, the interpreter, and the Department of Defense minder, except Adel doesn't know he's a Department of Defense minder. He assumes he's another lawyer working on his case. So he bear hugs all of us enthusiastically. In other words, he loves his enemy. And watching this guy from the Department of Defense turn various shades of red, I thought, you know, maybe there's a political dimension to this loving your enemy stuff. I've never seen them so disarmed as at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Paul Sullivan. I'm free. I have a question for you, Mr. Willett. You mentioned that the uh, amended McCain bill that habeas corpus will be suspended, but your clients could be covered prior to that. What happens if they remain the hundreds? Will they have any recourse? To the what? To the could you repeat the last part of that? You mentioned that in the... Um, yeah, what happens to the... Oh, what happens to the remaining hundreds that we're, you're not representing that are still well, in Guantanamo? The, the, the debate is whether, <laughs> is whether the bill applies to pending cases or, or just future cases. What we did and what the Center for Constitutional Rights did prior to the effective date of the act, we filed cases on behalf of everyone. Now, but, but let me say, though, the problem is... You know, Guantanamo, a new prisons being built. Is this going to be a holding facility for everyone caught in the war on terror? Uh, so in the future, um, it would not apply to future detainees who we haven't brought a case on behalf of. So we're hopeful that, you know, if this happens, we'll, you know, we'll fight politically and try to do something, but we try to do the best we can with what we have. It's a problem. Hi, uh, my name is Mark David Trachtenberg. I live in Brighton, Massachusetts. I'm a member of Amnesty International Group 151 here in uh, Boston and uh, coordinator of the group's campaign against the death penalty. I have two kind of different questions. Uh, first of all, it seems that whenever you apply for a new credit card uh, these days, near the end of your transaction with your friendly uh, customer service rep on the phone, your customer service rep reads this statement that says that uh, before they issue you the credit card, they, under the terms of the USA Patriot Act, they have to check uh, to make sure that you're not using the credit card to launder for terror money for terrorists. And uh, my question is, do you know of any instances where this provision of the USA Patriot Act has either been used to retaliate against people who are dissenting against the foreign policy of the USA or being used to, uh, uh, you know, get back at people who they kind of suspect but they don't have enough evidence to hold. Um, that's the first question. The second question is, what are your plans if there is an impeachment trial of George W. Bush for uh, testifying against him? I think both of those questions were for Tom Wilner. <laughs> well, whoever uh, wants to take it. There have been credit card fraud. You know, yeah, but there, there's been credit card fraud. I, I don't know evidence of them using the Patriot Act. Look, I, we don't know a lot of what's happening. Mm -hmm. There have been people held, um, uh, you know, immigrants in the country held for a long time without anything. I don't know of any instances of U.S. citizens. I'm sure. I mean, I was told by somebody, I, you know, I'm friendly with the head of the FBI. I've been told that all my calls are monitored. 
No, you know, I'm, because I guess I'm — because I probably talked to Gita, you know. Uh, but I don't know about that. Uh-huh. Your, all your calls are monitored. Overseas calls. Overseas. And you, you're told that you are, and they didn't even have to get a court order for that. They didn't. Whether they had to is another question. <laughs> well, legally they had to. I, I mean, well, uh, I, I, don't, I don't understand the Bush's argument that uh, they're exempt from the FISA court on this. It's an absurd argument. It's, a, it's like the argument that, that you can torture. You know, my son says that he says he's not a lawyer, he's a businessman. He says, oh, you know, the president has such great lawyers because they'll tell him whatever he, that he can do whatever he wants to do. <laughs> But that's what's happened. I mean, and that's really a little bit like Guantanamo. I'll tell you, the absurdity, the arrogance of the argument, you know, you can take a foreigner outside the United States and do what you want with them without being answerable to the law, is an arrogant argument. But it breeds a contempt for the law. And everything else you see is a contempt for the law. I yeah, what about what, email? Let, let, no, me just answer, let me just yeah. answer one aspect Sorry. of this. Um, okay. oh, all of the things that we're talking about that are happening tonight. I've read scholarly books on authoritarian regimes, it's often pointed out that perhaps the greatest characteristic of tyrants is that they are great simplifiers. In my opinion, President Bush and many of the neoconservatives qualify for that murderous designation. And I would like to know if there is some belief amongst people in the legal community, both at the national and international levels, that one of the reasons why there is such a breakdown of the protection of law is because the Bush administration is promulgating the propaganda of a war between righteous, radical Christian fundamentalism against evil Islamic terrorist fundamentalism. Well, think, think about the phrase almost everyone accepts, which is that we have a war on terror. I mean, terror is war, so we have a war on war. But no one doubts that there's a war on terror. In fact, Congress never declared any war on terror. Congress never declared any war. It declared that the president could use military force for a very narrow purpose, to pursue the 9-11 murderers and those who gave them comfort. So you're quite right. The, the, the great communicator is effective in bringing a message down to some simple level, and unfortunately, not enough people are inquisitive enough, enough to want to get behind the message and figure out as whether Tom's client really is some kind of terrorist or not. And let's not have a hearing, because then we might, that might get complicated, and we might actually hear that he's not. It's much easier to keep him on a desert island and just say he's a terrorist. That, that's a better, easier, simpler message that you can get on the nightly news. Let me just say uh, very quickly before I know you're going to um, – what I, Gita touched on what scares me the most and has been the most awakening thing for me. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm an, a little Jewish kid um, who grew up with tremendous respect for uh, uh, the principles of this country and what they stood for. And I would look at the history of Nazism, and, and I hear people would say, it can never happen here. And, I, you know, and I, I believe that, because I, I really believe that, it's what Gita said, that we had a fundamental belief, of, you know, we're, I always say this, we said in the Supreme Court brief, we're not like other countries, we're not like England or Germany or Japan, we're not bound together by a common race or religion, but by our principles. And, and they would never go away, and we had all sorts of checks, they would be the press, um, they would be Congress, they would be the judiciary. All of those have broken down in the hysteria over whether it's, I, I don't think it's the Christian versus Muslim, it's just the hysteria over terrorism has trumped 
every principal in this country. And I realized, as Gita said, the raw underside that's there. And the final protection is the rule of law, exactly what we're talking about, habeas corpus, these things which have there. And, and that's been wiped away. And, and I've seen, uh, you know, a fearsomeness in this country that really does scare me for the first time. We'll have our final question. Okay, well, it's sort of a question, but also I want to uh, support you guys in a couple of things. First of all, I think in Boston, the reason there's not a lot of people here is we have the zip car, charges twice the price of a regular car. But see, we're comfortability factor. And when you have comfortability factor, why do people want to sp speak up and rock the boat? Last year in September, only 12% of the voters turned out to vote in my area. Because everybody else was too comfortable, who knows what the reason. And that's the sad part, when people are too comfortable. When their own Democrats will speak for them, although Senator Kennedy and Kerry both voted for the Patriot Act, which doesn't s surprise me. Um, and I myself am an Arab Jew, by the way. And the reason I say that is because the first Jew go back a thousand years, same blood as the Arabs. So that was, gets me scared and sad to see what happens in the West Bank, what's going on there to the Palestinians by their brothers and sisters calling themselves Jews. Did they forget what happened in World War II? Some of them did, I think, and that's the sad part. So even in Israel, they forget. Um, I just want to go back to one something else determined. I was, uh, two things I want to quickly note. A friend of mine got arrested in Lexington, Mass., at a temple what, can, we, outside. Can, you, can you give us a question? Real quick, I just want to say that he got picked up by the cops sitting next to two people. They didn't arrest the other two people. They arrested him. They knew his name before they arrested him. I'm sure he was on the list. Because Homeland Security knows who he was on the list. I was inside, and they almost wanted to arrest me because they knew who I was. So what you're saying about in this country we have to watch out, they're looking out for everybody in this country now, just like they did under Hitler and under Stalin. But one of the nice things is about love, when I was in jail in Florida, Cape Canaveral, another prisoner with me who got arrested with me at Cape Canaveral, put his nuclear weapons, he would go up to everybody and says, I love you, to all the prisoners, to everybody, showing that love is the solution. We should all say we love to each other. His goal and solution realizes if we all love each other, we wouldn't have half the problems. Yeah. And that's something to think about. So there is one way to fight it, it is with love. Excuse me, do you have a question? No, I just want to support these people up here with some ideas All and right. things to think about. I think the crowd here knows uh, what they're saying. It's a very right. intelligent crowd, and they're all here, and we came here to hear the speakers today. So I respect them for what they want to say, and we'll learn from each other. All right, thank you very much. And I'd like to take this time now to thank our distinguished panel for this excellent program.